it does become difficult sometimes um, in uh, the continuity of teaching with uh, folks sometimes dropping in and out. Uh, of course, some things cannot be helped, sickness and work and the like. Uh, in a holidays such as this, so-called holidays, uh, there are no holy days for a Grace Age believer, none at all. But um, anyway, <clears throat> understand that. But sometimes the continuity of our teaching is, is difficult. Because uh, in and out, uh, people miss this and miss that, and, and sometimes for the life of me. As, as a pastor, uh, it, it will only be eternity probably that will help uh, to understand why people only come for one service and then leave and that sort of thing. It's, to me, it is absolutely idiotic. It's imbecilic. Um, people come and they call me on the phone. You know, I've had not so much anymore, but um, it's because I've said things like this. Uh, if you want to know, I, I will usually be teaching it, and people will have asked, uh, called me, and Pastor, answer me this question. And I would say, well, we just covered that. Why weren't you there? And uh, so people don't ask me much anymore. Now, there are times for bona fide questions. Don't misunderstand. But uh, to me, people mainly want to simply play church or play at church or be known in the community as the people who go to a, to a certain church. But true church membership is going to a church and studying systematically with what the pastor teacher has to say. Now, I said that at the beginning of 1993. I'm saying it at the end of 1993. I'll say it at the beginning of 1994 because only you folks who understand that concept are going to ever be winners. No one else is going to win. I don't care how sweet their personality. I don't care how much they give to charity or church. It doesn't matter. Only those, church, uh, those members, those Christians with gumption enough to be there if at all possible are going to ever win with God because other than that you live your life you have to make it up there's just no way it's just like going to school and you miss you miss the first three weeks of a six-week course uh, you know you're studying Shakespeare or what have you and you miss the first three weeks and um, and then you come and you pass the test and you go, well I don't know this material well, but you weren't there. You should have been. Did you have an excuse? No. The problem is with the legal system, we can send our truant officers and arrest people for not going to school. But you can't do that for not coming, coming to church. But those people are losing, and they're losers at life. They have to make up Christianity from human viewpoint, and it is impossible, impossible to win. Okay, now just like with these genealogies, I've had people to, to ask about genealogies, and then, then where are they when it comes time to study it? I'll never know. We we talk about we're talking about six lines found in the Bible. The divine line, the purebred line, the blessed line, the registered line, the natural legal line, and the regal legal line. Uh, I was going to put eagle in there too, but I thought maybe enough is enough. I wasn't sure. <laughs> but uh, the purebred line covers uh, ten men. The first ten men, as far as God is concerned, that are important. The blessed line that we're going to study now goes from 11 to 20. That's important to know because these two are going to cover the dispensation of conscience, just put DC here, and the other one, the dispensation of human government. <clears throat> now, the study of genealogies takes on new meaning when you understand that they are also the studies of dispensationalism. Because the first two genealogies in the scripture called the purebred line, we've named it that, and the blessed line, we've named it that, cover the first two dispensations found in the Bible. So we look then, as we go clear over here, to see that the purebred line covers the dispensation of conscience. All right, over here, we're going to have the blessed line. The blessed line is going to take us all the way through the dispensation of human government. So, 
it's easy for you to, uh, to remember these lists because the first 10 men in the genealogy of Christ take us through the first dispensation. They guarantee that he was not tainted with any uh, of the genetic material of the fallen angels, the Nephilim or the Rephaim. The next 10 are going to show us that God gave up the Gentiles and picked a special line with a fellow by the name of Shem. So let's come back here and the first thing that we want to do over here we will put the purebred line. Okay, starting down here, we will put the blessed line. Up here, we are going to put the registered line. All right, over here, we will put the, the natural line. I'm sorry, I didn't do this before. But this is found in the book of Genesis, the purebred line as we have it. Then also in Genesis chapter 9 and 11, we're going to look at the blessed line. Over here, eventually we'll get to 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 3, uh, which give us the registered line. Then we're going to look in Luke, which gives us the total line of Christ, the total natural line of Christ. And then over here, we're going to go to Matthew, and Matthew is going to give us the royal line. But his line doesn't even pick up until Abraham. Doesn't even mention it. There's no need. He's presenting him as king of the Jews. And so all he has to do is, is um, uh, take him back, as it were, uh, through David to Abraham. Now, we're, the line is not complete, and it's going to take us a little while to wade through all of these. I just wanted to let you know where we were. Okay. Now we're going to begin studying the second dispensation or the second important line of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts off with a man by the name of Shem. Shem's name in the Hebrew is actually pronounced shame, but it's no shame to be named Shem. The word means name above every name. That's exactly what it means. And if you'll note Genesis chapter 9, it says in verse 18, And the sons of Noah that went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 19, These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Now, it's important to uh, note this just simply because if you'll come back to chapter 5, holding your place there in verse 32, God is going to go to great lengths to show us something here. Though Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, were born on the other side of the dispensation of innocence, God shows us that from Adam to Noah, the line of humanity was purebred. He's going to get rid of everybody else. So Shem gets on the ark with Noah and his other two brothers and their wives. Verse 32 says, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, why was this important to let us know this? Chapter 6, verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, these are the generations of Noah. He was a just man and perfect in his generations. The word perfect there is the Hebrew tamim. We've studied it many times before. And it means genetically perfect. He was without spot or blemish, humanly speaking. He was not uh, affected by the Nephilim in any way. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the natural conclusion is simply this. They were as well purebred human beings. So it takes us then from the purebred line 
<laughs> the purebred line. I haven't been in a bread line in a long time. When I was uh, at college, we used to call them bread lines where we would wait there with the tray. But uh, anyway, the purebred line uh, of human beings now to the blessed line. God gave up the Gentiles. You've got to remember that. He gave them up. Gentiles in grace today are privileged, but back then they were not, only as they associated themselves in a right relationship with Shem, and uh, especially then the line of Abraham. So, verse number 26. Verse number 26. Here's where the beginning of the blessed line uh, means, or begins. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth. He shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, remember we studied before, and we're back here in the Old Testament, that Japheth was the oldest, Ham was second, and Shem was the youngest. And what happened was, is that Japheth went down to the second, Ham, Ham went down to the third, and Shem went up to the top. Principle in election, the, the uh, older shall serve the younger. And so that's exactly what we have here. God's making a switcheroo and placing the youngest on top. And why did he do that? Because he wanted to give him a name which is above every name. The Gentiles are out and all others are out except those that come from the line of Shem. All right, now. The second name here, as we go to chapter 11, and starting with verse number 10, the second name here is, is somewhat hard to discern or decipher. It uh, was undoubtedly a name given of foreign origin, and they mixed a couple of words together. It in the English is our faxad. Now, in verse number 10, it says, These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old, and he begat our faxad two years after the flood. Now, again, now we have, we have something going for us here. Who's on the other side of the flood? First man, Shem. Two years after the flood, he begat our Faxad. Begins filling in the line through this second dispensation of, of, of human government. But our Faxad uh, is unusual here because the, the first meaning of his name could be one that releases. One that releases. Or the second one, the cursed breast. Now, both names are pretty significant here. And the reason that they are significant is because of the name of a man that is the son of Arphaxad. That name is mentioned only one place in the Bible, only one. His name is deleted, blotted out, eliminated, erased from every other record between Arphaxad and Selah, except for the natural line found in Luke. Let's go there to Luke chapter three. Luke chapter 3. If you'll note, we go backwards from verse number 38. Every other genealogical record is a descent from Adam. 
But as far as, as far as Luke is concerned, it is what's called an ascent back, uh, excuse me, uh, an ascent from uh, Christ back uh, to Adam. You go from Adam to Christ, that's the descent, from, from um, Christ to Adam, that's the ascent. Okay, here's the name. Let's just go backwards from verse 38. Son of God, which was Adam, son of God, Seth, or son of uh, uh, Adam, Seth, son of Seth, Enos, son of Enos, Canaan. Now that's the first time it's mentioned here, verse 4. He's known in the list. Okay, but this is a different man. Malaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Arphaxad. Now note in verse 36. We have the listing there of a name of a man that's not listed in any of the other records. Now the answer to this, of course, is that God blotted his name out from being part of the blessed line or the registered line. He must have done something we don't know of, at least I don't as yet. I've not figured out uh, uh, why his name is here and not in the others. He's not in Matthew because it only goes back to Abraham. But he is in Luke. Now, the significance then of the name of our Arphaxad is that our Arphaxad is going to have a son by the name of Canaan. And Canaan is going to be what? Cursed. How do we know that? Because our facts, our facts said means one that releases. There's no obligation, nothing binding here in the line or the cursed breast. And his son Canaan, and we will take Canaan up when we get to the natural line of Luke, was completely omitted from the blessed line of, of Shem and the registered line of the writer of First Chronicles. Okay. Let's move on then to the next man in our list, back to Genesis chapter 11. God used the appellation obliteration to totally remove Canaan's name from the blessed line and the registered line of Christ. Of course, the divine line doesn't carry it. Matthew only goes back to Abraham, and uh, he would have been about seven um, seven or eight from Abraham. Okay, we'll discuss him later. Let's go now to Selah. Verse number 12. Our facts had lived 530 years and begat Selah. Now you'll remember that Canaan's name goes between our facts had and Selah, obliterated by God for some reason. And our facts had, his name means the cursed breast. Canaan would have gotten his nourishment from the cursed breast. His name was removed from that line. But we have a fellow by the name of Selah. What's the significance of his name? It means the sprout. Now again, uh, one of the Nephilim by the name of the Jolly Green Giant must have existed. And uh, he had a little son by the name of Sprout. And we've all seen him on television. I believe that was what his name was called. Well, here is a dead seed, as it were. But up from the ruin, up from the death, came Selah, the Sprout, the reemergence of the line. And that's the important thing to see here. A name that's above every name, but immediately we have another name that indicates one in the line would be cursed from his birth, from the breast. But despite that, Selah indicates that God is beginning to reform this, this line so that instead of having 11 men, one is removed, we still only have 10 men that will take us through the next two dispensations or the, the first two dispensation. Okay, let's go to verse 14. Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. Now, Eber here is an interesting name because there are several things that, uh, several ways that it can be translated. From this we get Abraham the Hebrew. It means one that 
crossed over, one who left the Gentiles and, and crossed over uh, the Euphrates River in favor of the Abrahamic covenant, leaving the Gentiles behind. So it's one who crossed over. And again, God is beginning to uh, narrow down and pinpoint the exact family through whom Messiah is going to come. But his, also, his name also means from the sprout now comes the, the shoot, the, the stalk that's coming up from the ground. All right. The next man, verse number 16. And Eber lived four and thirty years and begat Peleg. Now Peleg is an interesting man because his name means division. And if you hold your place here in chapter 11 and just simply go back to chapter 10, The earth was undoubtedly of one solid landmass before this man was born. But at this time, if you've often wondered, and we've, we've had, uh, uh, we're going to have the, the Tower of Babel and, and the various things here, but remember, we're, we're putting in a genealogy here in, in chapter 10, and then we're going to explain. Remember, this genealogy covers the totality of the dispensation of human government. Somewhere along the line, Peleg was born and the earth was divided. Now some are going to wonder, how in the world, or why in the world are there only kangaroos in Australia? Why are some of the people there, some of the animals that are indigenous there and they don't find them any other place in the world and in South America and so forth? Here is the reason why. Verse 25, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days the earth was divided. We had evidently a monumental uh, 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 textbook class A earthquake in his days. And so they named him division at that time. And that's the explanation for some of the animals that are indigenous to certain parts of the world and not found in other places. They were literally, as it were, blocked off by the oceans of water, as you have the, the, um, the uh, continent of Australia, for one example. All right, let's move on. Here's another interesting name. Verse number 18. In verse 16, Eber lived four and thirty years and get Peleg. And after the division, it says in verse 18, Peleg lived thirty years and begat Rahu. In, uh, in Luke, it's interesting, it's <laughs> Ragu. Now, I don't know if this was with uh, onions and, and, and uh, mushrooms or what have you. I don't know if this was thick or the thinner sauce. But uh, Reu's name transliterated over, it uh, came out ragu. Well, uh, that doesn't sound bad right at the moment. A little bit of ragu on our study, make it a little more tasty. His name actually means friend. <clears throat> now, just before we flip and, and get to the come then to the end of this line with just a few more names, I want you to notice that I have kept the numeric purity of the line in the purebred and the blessed line and even in the registered line simply by showing that Canaan should have been there but not numbering him. He is not included. God has obliterated his name. But from the natural line, he was there. And so there is the difference in our numbering in our numbering system. We will come back and get his name and the significance there later on. Right now we're moving toward somebody that is first called a friend of God. 
Well, make, make that second. Enoch was a friend of God. He walked with God. But Abraham is also called a friend of God, par excellence. And we're moving just a few short names later to Abraham, who is the friend of God. Okay, let's go to verse number 20. First we have the sprout, then we have the shoot, now we have the branch. Verse 20, Reu lived two and thirty years and begat Serug. Serug's name means the branch. And time and again, you will find in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ where he has talked about the, the, the root of Jesse, you know, a, a stem that's going to come out of, of David, a branch of David and that sort of thing. Well, it's from the blessed line from Shem to Abraham that God is, is narrowing down. He's bringing us to a point in a climax. He's funneling all other uh, options and names down to one man's name who is the friend of God. And through him, the, the branch of the righteous one is is going to come. And that, of course, is Abraham. But uh, we have gone then from the sprout to the shoot to the branch. God is growing a tree and showing us which direction to go to look for the coming of the Messiah. Okay. Verse number 22. <clears throat> Three more names. Sarah lived 30 years and begat Nahor. Now, Nahor's name is, uh, is an interesting name. I'm not exactly sure why it, he was named thus, except all of the Bible names are extremely Im important. But he was the, he was the one who was the Snorter. <laughs> Have you ever snorted? Actually, uh, it, it has to do with the fact that most probably he uh, snorted like a, like a horse in, in, in bucking and trying to, to throw off the will of God. Now, what do I mean by that? You remember that all of these people were living in the Ur of the Chaldees during Nimrod's time. They were all idolaters uh, that, were, that were converted uh, eventually and, and served then in this line. And uh, some of them probably gave up uh, more willingly than others. And Nahor was one, shown by his name, who was undoubtedly just a little bit stubborn. But eventually he was won over and he was kept in the line. And despite the fact of his rebellion, despite the fact that he didn't want to give up his idolatry, uh, and even as shown in his sons later on, we studied the teraphim, or one of his sons later on, kept these household idols, though they knew about Jehovah God and the Abrahamic covenant, he still kept his teraphim. And that shows just a little bit of rebellion there. Two more names. <clears throat> Verse number 24. Here is the father of Abraham. Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. The interesting thing about Terah's name is that it means delay. Now let's just read the narrative here that we have with Terah and see why it was a delay. Now, Terah lived uh, 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, Nahor, the second man, was named for his grandfather, Nahor. And both of them were snorters, and it shows in their family line. They, they were reluctant to give up their idolatry, and so God called them snorters. You know, just uh, didn't want to give in, didn't want their will to be broken, like a wild horse. Okay. Uh, Verse number 31, here's why his name is called the delay. Abraham was delayed in going to the promised land because of his father, Terah. Evidently, there was a warning about the idolatrous practices of Nimrod. 
and about what was going on. And evidently, Abraham had been told of the Lord to get to the promised land. But in keeping with his father, rather than doing what God said, verse 31, Terah took Abraham his son and Lot his son, the son of Haran, and Sarah, Abraham's wife, and they went forth from them, the earth of the Chaldees, to go to the land of Canaan. But they came to Haran and dwelt there. Instead of pursuing it all the way to the place of blessing, as God told Abraham, Abraham stayed with his father, Terah, and there was a delay in the, in the blessing of Abraham. Had he stayed there and never gone to the promised land, he would have never been what he was, the friend of God or what he was to become, the friend of God and the last in the blessed line and then the first in the royal line. Let's read three more verses, a comment, and we're through. <clears throat> and now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. Get out. I told you to get out before. But you followed your father, and his name means delay, and you were delayed these years. Okay, once you get there, I'll make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless them to bless thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Four times, four again, the number of creation. Israel's God's earthly people. Four times you'll be a blessing. So, we go again to the end of the blessed line. It starts with the fact that God said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And he gave him the name that is above every name. Ten names later, it ends with Abraham. And, Abraham, and to Abraham he said, They're going to call you blessed as well. But the name Abraham here, actually Abram, means exalted father. We'll take up the name of Abraham then the next time. He had a name change. And that, of course, is significant of a dispensational change. And that brings us right back to this point in the blessed line. Let's just go through them. And then we're almost through. Shem, our facts had. Canaan's name was removed. Selah, Eber, Peleg, He's, he's right in the middle too, remember, just like uh, Mehe Le Liel, that means the uh, praise of God. Here we have the division happening right in the center. It's God's, it's God's <laughs> grace that uh, kept the line pure. It's God's grace that is dividing humanity now. Here we have Reu or Ragu, whichever you'd like to call him, a father of the Italians. No, just joking, just joking. Okay. Here is Serug, Nahor, Terah, and it ends then with Abraham. Ten more names to the list takes us through two dispensations. Now, what, what does it prove? What does it show us? First of all, that the study of genealogies is extremely important, and it is dispensational. Uh, the first 10 names of, the, of the, uh, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ cover two dispensations, totally. Take us through these two dispensations. Now, the one indicates pure breeding, so that when we come to Christ, we know that he was truly a human and that uh, there was nothing of any genetic taint, but then that he is of the two especially blessed, doubly blessed people, First, Shem, doubly blessed. Blessed is the Lord God of Shem, and you're going to be first in line for the blessing. You've got a name which is above every name. And we descend all the way down then to Abraham, who is called blessed four times in the scripture and made to be an exalted father of the royal line of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's going to come to come here. The royal line of the Lord Jesus Christ will cover the dispensation of promise and the dispensation of law to the birth of Christ.